Good morning, and welcome to our first and only fully vodcasted lecture for this semester. If you're watching this from the lecture hall today, then it is Friday the 28th, and although I can't be there, I'm hoping that the snow is still falling and that the ski season is truly on its way. I don't have a lot of announcements for you today, um, just a couple, but for lecture, your homework eight will be due next week as usual, and if you're or if you're organized and your poster group is ready for it, then please begin submitting your poster presentation abstracts um, as soon as next week if you're ready to do so. In terms of lab, there's only just one thing I thought I would mention today, and that is that you're into you're beginning to get into the heart of your unknown identification. So you may want to think about printing the dichotomous keys that are found under additional information on the lab website, and you might find that those are really useful to you. Um, some of you. You may have already done that, and if so, kudos and well done. Let's go ahead and jump in today because it is a super exciting day. Um, it, it may be one of my favorite because we're going to get to talk about the full horizontal gene transfer and bacterial recombination. So to kind of situate us where we left off last time, remember that we were talking about mutation and we had spent a lot of time covering that particular mechanism by which an organism could undergo change to its genotype. But now we're going to focus in on the method of recombination, the methods of recombination that will allow for changes to genotype, often very, very rapidly. So this can be sort of confusing terminology wise. There's just a lot of sexy minded lingo that goes into the whole um, horizontal gene transfer, HGT, LGT. Um, these are already some of those sexy minded terms. So we can write the abbreviation sometimes that you see for horizontal gene transfer is HGT or sometimes we see it written as LGT, which is lateral gene transfer, both of which are saying the exact same thing. What they're saying is that um, DNA is transferred from a donor cell to a recipient cell. Sometimes that's via a convoluted path, but essentially we're looking at a transfer, a unidirectional transfer of genetic material. Now sometimes if that material is stably incorporated into the recipient cell, then we say that a recombination has taken place. So it's interesting to note that sometimes we can get an HGT or LGT without resulting recombination. <laughs> Sounds sexy, doesn't it? But sometimes on the other hand, we get HGT and LGT resulting in recombination. So in order to truly see recombination, it has to be a change to the genome of the recipient cell, the cell that has received that new DNA. So let's jot down some of this and along with a few more sexy minded terms and that is that the donor DNA or the DNA coming from an outside source is always called the exogenate, whereas the DNA of the recipient cell is always termed the endogenate. That is um, just a way for us to differentiate the DNA from the outside source versus the DNA that is already existing there within the cell that receives it. If a lateral gene transfer occurs where the um, nature of the endogenate changes, that is to say that the genome is changed by the HGT event, then we say that recombination has taken place. Sometimes we get a situation where an HGT does happen, there is a gene transfer, but the cell um, that receives that new DNA isn't changed for whatever reason. We'll talk about that here in a minute. Let's take a moment to refresh your mind on something that I know you already know, and that is the three mechanisms of horizontal gene transfer. Remember, two out of the three are just a little bit kinky. So the first one is DNA transformation, and remember that that is the uptake of naked DNA. Naked meaning that the DNA is not contained within a cell. For example, in nature, maybe a cell just underwent lysis because it was attacked by a bacteriophage and a bunch of naked DNA was thus freed into the environment. We then know that that DNA is considered naked because it's outside of its original cell. 
The second mechanism, transduction. Transduction is where the um, bacteriophage taxicab is used to get DNA from a donor to a recipient. Now that's an accident, remember? We sometimes call it a defective bacteriophage because that phage has accidentally packaged its host, its um, capsid head with host DNA. So we see that phage making a mistake and taking away from the cell that it has um, previously infected host DNA rather than its own phage DNA. So then it takes that over to the recipient cell and delivers um, new DNA from another bacterium to that recipient cell. Finally, and our favorite, conjugation or bacterial cell sex, where in fact DNA is transferred by cell to cell contact. Conjugation is the only method of HGT where we actually see that true link between the donor and the recipient cell. So cell to cell contact only occurs in that third mechanism of conjugation. We'll save the best for last, talking about conjugation last, and we'll begin by talking about transformation. But before we can do that, let's say a few words about in just general features of all three mechanisms of HGT. First of all, the DNA transfer is always unidirectional. That is to say that this is not um, a system of reciprocity. <laughs> we don't see the donor cell giving DNA to the recipient cell and the recipient cell says, dude, that was awesome. Thanks so much. Let me give you back a little bit of my DNA. Um, doesn't happen that way. So it's not reciprocal. It is only unidirectional. We also can recognize that when DNA is transferred, it's not like the donor cell gives up all of its DNA and the recipient cell takes in all of the DNA from the donor. So that is to say that small amounts of DNA are transferred. And if that DNA is chromosomal, we never see the entire chromosome getting transferred. So it's not like the whole, you know, whole nine yards is sent over to the recipient cell. Even in conjugation, we don't ever see that happening. Um, so sorry about that. So we recognize then that if DNA transfer is chromosomal, only part of the chromosome is usually transferred. And we'll look at certain cells where chromosomal transfer is definitely possible, but it's only going to be a fraction or a percentage of that chromosome that ever gets transferred. Now, this last one I thought I'd pick on Katrina and Sam, Sam K, um, because they're always doing such awesome work in the lab, and I know they did a really good job when it came to their transformation, because I remember them sitting and working out the transformation efficiency calculation that was the challenge question in um, their lab notebook. So what they might remember, and um, perhaps if they had that day of the transformation forgotten to label their transformation plates, right, it could happen. Um, so if Sam forgot to label the plates, and Katrina's looking at those plates and she's like, okay, which one of these plates was the one that was the plus P glow where we tried to do the transformation? Which one might have been the minus P glow where we just put it on a regular old LB plate? And if you're looking at these two plates at the bottom there, which one, the one with isolated colonies or the one with the lawn of bacterial growth, you know, we want to know which one was the minus P glow on LB. So just plain old E. coli put onto a non-selective medium, which one was that one? Versus which one was the plus P glow on LB plus AMP? That is the selective auger with ampicillin. Well, we know that the only thing that could grow on the second one are transformants, right? Only things that took up the DNA could grow on the plus P glow or the plate label plus P glow with LB amp in it. So we know that only a fraction of the potential recipient cells will ever take up that plasmid. And Katrina and Sam probably calculated that on their transformation efficiency, noting that probably less than every one, one in 1,000 cells would take up that plasmid. So that would easily allow Katrina to label this plate as being the one that was the LB with AMP that the potential transformants were plated on because only a few of the possible recipient cells or only one in every 1,000 or less actually took up that P-glow plasmid. Now, on the other hand, we could label this one as the mi minus P-glow on LB because it's non-selective. All the cells could grow on that, not just the successful transformants.
So this is a good visual way to allow us to make the next general statement about all methods of HDT, and that is that DNA is never transferred to more than a small fraction of the potential recipient cells. So in an environment loaded with possible recipients, only some of them will take it up, less than one in every 1,000, in fact. So we'll write that down. Only a small fraction of the possible recipient cells will actually take up that DNA. Okay, so now that we have written down a few general principles for all types of horizontal gene transfer, let's go on and take a quick look at um, what can happen to the exogenous. That is, um, again, to say what happens when that donor DNA, the outside DNA, is transferred to the recipient cell. What are some possible things that can happen to it after that transfer? So one thing that we know can definitely happen is that it can actually integrate into the genome of that recipient. Perhaps it even integrates into the chromosome of the recipient cell. In which case, we know that that recipient cell is now called a stable recombinant. It has now taken in the DNA, it has integrated it, it expresses whatever uh, components of that DNA it did integrate. So that is a stable, that is a stable event, um, one in which a stable recombinant is made. But that's not always the case. Every once in a while, um, a cell will take up the DNA from the donor, but the integration will never take place. And sometimes it just chills in the cytosol, and occasionally it even gets um, propagated very randomly. Um, that's a very unusual fate where we could say that it may persist and replicate outside of the chromosome and not really ever integrate. That's very rare. But in those cases, those cells, it's weird, are actually partially diploid. They actually may express more than one copy of a gene, one that came from the donor and one that they already had in the recipient. More frequently with this, it's not persistent. That is to say that it may survive in one cell that, that takes up the DNA, that takes up the um, exogenous. It may survive, that exogenous DNA may survive for a while and make that one recipient cell partially diploid. This happens a lot in transduction, but it, it won't, it won't replicate. That is, it won't be passed to progeny cells, so we won't see it surviving on down through progeny cells. Now, the other possible fate, and probably the one that I find the most hilarious, is that once um, HGT has happened, right, say conjugation occurs and a donor cell passes DNA to a recipient cell, well, when that donor um, DNA is taken in, the recipient cell might simply recognize that donor DNA as being foreign, and it might just chew it up. So nucleases may just simply degrade and digest that DNA. So we may see that an HGT event occurs, but the exogenous DNA, once inside of the recipient cell, just gets degraded. So this is, I find this hilarious, and it reminds me of this one um, stand-up comic routine that um, Ellen DeGeneres does, where she's talking about how um, some people like to videotape their sex, and she's trying to make sense of, like, what they do with it afterwards, and so she's like, oh yeah, they probably sit down and do, like, a coaching session with it, where they're just, like, looking at the TV, and they're like, ooh, yeah, no, that was good, that was well done, no, G definitely, you know, oh, looks good, looks great, but now wait, wait, here, oh, energy, 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 nothing. <laughs> so every time I think of this, I think energy, 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 nothing, right? Because there's this whole HGT event that takes place, but then nothing happens with that donor DNA. It is simply degraded. Okay, on that note, we can move along to DNA transformation as the first method um, of recombination or potentially leading to recombination event. So transformation, we remember from lab and our discussion in lab that it can either be linear or plasmid DNA that's taken up by a recipient cell. On the left, um, the picture I've drawn here shows that the naked free DNA in the environment is linear DNA, and that that linear DNA will be taken up. Interestingly, only one strand of the linear DNA is taken up, and sometimes it will orient itself next to the chromosome and replace a piece of the recipient chromosome. So we could say in sexy-minded language that the exogenous replaces a portion of the endogenous DNA. So that's 
that's what we call complete integration of that linear DNA. So you get linear DNA uptake and um, potentially integration. The other fate is degradation, right? The energy, energy, nothing. Because here we see that, in fact, that linear DNA can simply be degraded by host nucleases and is never integrated, and nothing ever really comes of that horizontal gene transfer. Over on the right, um, you'll notice here, this is the transfer with chromosomal DNA. So, um, or excuse me, <laughs> this is the transfer with plasmid DNA. So you can notice here that the plasmid DNA is taken up by the recipient cell, um, and then unlike linear DNA, does not get integrated. But we know that plasmids have their own origin of replication, and will be able to self-replicate and persist within the cytosol. So this is a little bit different in that the plasmid stays in the cytosol, plasma resides there where it replicates. One thing you might also note here is that we haven't shown the fate of potential degradation. And that's because it's much rarer with plasmid DNA because plasmids, of course, are circular and they're not quite as subject to the Pac-Man chewing, right? Amanda's out there doing her Pac-Man. Um, <laughs> the Pac-Man chewing that can take place on a linear piece of DNA, we don't see that quite as readily on this uh, plasmid DNA. Okay, great. So the two types, either linear or plasmid, we're going to focus here in lecture on linear uh, DNA transformation because we focused in lab on plasmid DNA transformation. So before we get into the depths of all of that, let's go ahead and take a moment to talk about um, just the basics of transformation um, and the fact that not all cells are readily willing and able to take up external DNA. Cells that are capable of being transformed are termed competent cells. Many different types of bacterial genera are actually naturally competent. I've listed a few here. Um, some of those species that will just readily take up uh, DNA from the environment. Often these are things found in aquatic and soil environments that, you know, are constantly very uh, packed with a lot of cells and are um, swapping DNA and undergoing a lot of rapid natural selection. And this is a great environment to be ready and willing to take up external DNA. So Bacillus Remember, many of you had that as your unknown. Some of you have it as your unknown again with this um, newest unknown identification. So you'll be trying to identify um, potentially this soil bacterium, Bacillus. Neisseria is another one that can naturally take up DNA. Um, Streptococcus is one that also has natural competence factors and is, are, is able to do that. Pseudomonas is another that we haven't listed here. Haemophilus, um, Azotobacter is another soil bacterium. So there are several genera that will do this naturally. Um, interestingly, the one that we worked with in the lab, E. coli, doesn't do this naturally. So it has to be made competent. And remember that whole nine yards that we put it through, um, rinsing it in calcium chloride, doing all those spins to make the cells naturally competent so that when you heat shock them, and again, you had to heat shock them to get the DNA to go in, you know, you had to go through a lot of lab protocol to make them take up that DNA. Some cells are even more um, difficult to transform, and I know Jeremy has done some of this in, in your research lab, um, and we have to actually use something called electroporation. So rather than simple chemical treatment, you may actually put them into an electroporator and shock the heck out of them to get them to take up the DNA. Um, and this is a photograph that looks very much like the electroporator that I used when I was in grad school, and maybe it looks a lot like the one that Jeremy uses in his lab as well. Um, Jeremy, if you are so inclined, take a picture of your electroporator that I could use for um, class. That would be way cool. Um, this is simply one that I found on the internet that happens to look, I swear, it looks just like the one that I used in grad school. <laughs> so, so electroporation is a more extreme method to get the cells to shock them electrically to get them to take up uh, the DNA, the naked DNA in their environment. So electroporation, uh, chemical treatment, these are ways to get, make cells competent that aren't naturally competent. Um, it's actually kind of interesting. I was talking, I think it was with Kevin Brown the other day about this, that, um, that sometimes um, there's an interest in getting human cells to take up DNA. And um, some years ago, the scientific world was all abuzz about the fact that human cells are actually somewhat naturally competent and that um, 
that started the craze of trying to develop DNA vaccines. So trying to get DNA into human cells to get your cells to express uh, antigenic compounds to get um, a natural sort of a different method of vaccinating. And so we, Kevin and I had talked a, a bit about this and I was telling him about how sometimes um, human cells are even electroporated. And I have here, um, this is an immunology in the news article, and I, I don't know if you guys can see it if I turn it around here a bit. Um, this was in 2007, but still a very applicable technique. And let me read you just a little passage from this um, so one of the problems with DNA vaccines is that the molecules are large and have trouble getting through the cell wall to the nucleus where they do their work. So helping to increase the amount of DNA vaccines that get into the nucleus, um, we can use electrical pulse. So um, this is like human electroporation. So the, the companies here described in this article have devices that administer a quick electrical pulse to muscle tissue in which the DNA vaccine has already been injected. And the electrical field creates a temporary opening in the cell membrane and allows more DNA vaccines to enter into the cell. Um, so it's interesting, an interesting article about electroporation for DNA vaccines. Let me know if you want to see that article.